Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden, and today we're going to be talking about seed starting. And we're gonna start from the beginning, which is how I prepare my soil, and then we're gonna get into how to actually fill trays, put the seeds in, and care for them. And this is actually going to be a multi-part series. So today we're gonna to be talking about starting, and then the next video we'll probably be talking about transplanting and seedlings and potting up. So with that said, let's get into the soil mixture. So what I have in front of me is a black cement mixing tub. This is a very standard thing you can find at pretty much any hardware store. And then what I have here is a two by four sieve that I made. Uh, it's just four pieces of wood and a piece of hardware cloth on the bottom. In this case, I believe it's eighth of an inch. Usually I go quarter inch, but I found this one first, so we'll use it today. We'll see how it works. The main idea here is actually just that uh, instead of buying seed starting mix, which is commonly available, I like to just get a high quality potting mix that I already know and like to use. And I like to sift that to make my own seed starting mix. Because seed starting mix is actually really just about it not having any major sticks or twigs or anything like that, rocks. Because the idea is that if you're starting seeds and your seed is sitting under, for example, I just saw a nice piece like a rock like that, there's a good chance your seed's not gonna make it, especially if it's something like an alyssum or a poppy, something that has very small seedlings to start. So we wanna try to get rid of any of this big, coarse, chunky material. The other reason is that if you have coarse material, like a bunch of sticks sitting on top of your seeds, it's going to make it harder to germinate because the moisture is not gonna be as good. It's not gonna be right on the seed, which is where you want it. So that's why we're sifting. And again, like you could use any mix. Personally lately, especially when it gets into summer, I like to make sure that the mix that I'm using has some amount of coconut core in it. The reason for that is that coconut core hydrates a lot easier than peat does. So when it's really hot and like, let's say you should have watered your seedlings three hours ago and now they look really dry. If you have a purely peat mix, it's gonna be very difficult to rehydrate that. So even if it has like 50% coconut core, it makes a really big difference. And if you can't find a potting mix that has that, you could just get coconut core separately and mix it in at like 30, 50%. So now that I've sifted the potting mix, you could see what's left behind. And that's extremely coarse material. There's rocks, there's big chunks of perlite, twigs, sticks, you name it. All those things are generally fine in a potting mix, but when you're starting seeds, you really wanna make sure you don't have that. And if you're buying seed starting mix, hopefully it doesn't have that already. So what we're left with here is a nice, very fine sort of soil base. And this is going to be perfect for germinating seeds because it's gonna have a very high contact ratio with your seeds and make sure that it gets the moisture it needs to germinate. That's why we're doing that step. Now, a couple things I personally like to add in. None of this, by the way, is required. You could start seeds even in native soil. It'll just be a little more challenging but I like to just go the full mile. So what I'm gonna do is what I have down here is a bag of worm castings. So I'm going to throw in, and like um, probably two scoops. I don't have an exact ratio. So if you're wondering, I'm not sure, I'm going with two scoops. <laughs> None of this is exact. With worm castings, it's nice because they're not that strong like in terms of fertilizer. So it's no big deal in terms of overdoing it at the start. The next thing I'm gonna throw in here is a smaller scoop of azomite or rock dust or glacial dust. It has a lot of different names. This is just a basically ground up rock. And the idea behind it is it has all these little micronutrients that plants might need. It might be like that one nutrient is missing and it's gaining your whole plant from success. And this is really not to necessarily smooth out the germination process, but it's actually for when I transplant it in my garden I wanna make sure that it has at least the very trace amount of trace elements that it needs. So this is gonna make sure that as I'm transplanting it out into my garden, if I have some weird micronutrient deficiency, this will hopefully solve that. And since I sifted it, I actually lost a lot of perlite. So what I'm going to do is add some uh, vermiculite. It's similar to perlite, except that it holds water, whereas perlite is more of just for air. Um, I have a big bag of this handy, so I'm gonna go ahead and just mix this in. The nice thing about this, is again, it increases germination in the summer where it gets really hot and dry. The more kind of moisture aids that you have, the better, honestly. And the vermiculite is also nice because it does let some air in since it's a mineral. It doesn't get compressed or break down. And it makes your potting mix nice and sparkly. So that's pretty nice. So there's the final product. 
couple little chunks of azomite left. What we're gonna do now is fill the trays. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to actually do that. As you know, you've probably seen me talk about these before. I'm a massive fan of these Epic 6Ls. I haven't found anything better. And I've bought a lot of the other kind of versions of this, but this is by far my favorite. I still have a lot of old nursery pots around and until they break down fully, I'll probably still keep using them. So in this case, I have some sunflowers growing. This is just from a six pack of starts that I bought. I just wanted to mention that you could really use anything that you want, but these are my favorite because they make it really easy to take the seedlings out. It makes it really easy to see how the root growth is going. There's a lot of advantages. And honestly, my favorite thing is that there's six packs that are small, which let me label either two seeds at a time, three seeds at a time, or a whole six pack at once. And I'll talk more about that when we start some seeds. But what I wanted to show you is that there's holes on the bottom. So when I fill these, you have a couple different options. My personal preference is I put a little bit of soil in the bottom. And then once I do that, I'll just take my thumb or finger and push it down. And the idea behind this is that by doing that, I'm creating a nice bottom so that when I do bottom watering, this, the soil is actually at the bottom of the tray and it makes it easier for the water to wick its way up. The other option is that you fill it with some soil and you can fill it like all the way and then you tap it down on the surface. And so now, as I turn this up, you can see that there is soil at the bottom. And that's really what you want to make sure. That's the only caveat I'd say. So that's how you fill that. It's the same idea with these bigger trays. For the bigger trays, you could actually go ahead and even use like an unsifted potting mix because what I'm going to be using these for is actually for squash seeds or cucumbers, things that have bigger seeds. It doesn't really matter that I have this perfect fine material. So I'll probably fill that with straight potting mix, but let's go ahead and fill these up and we'll talk a little bit about planting your seeds, sowing your seeds and taking care of them. So we have all of our trays filled with soil and now we could actually start the seeds. So I wanted to mention a couple different things here. So for anything that has small seeds like peppers, most flower seeds, like I'm gonna actually go in with some queen line zinnias. Those are great in these smaller cells. Now there's a reason why you have to start with a smaller amount of soil and not just go straight to a big pot of soil. And the main reason is that it comes to water. So if I have something like a, here's an example. If I have something like this, this is a uh, alyssum a small seedling you could see when they come up they're quite tiny if i was to put these seeds in this big pot it would be very challenging to manage the water appropriately because they will never suck up all the water out of this by the time they grow to a big enough size so what happens is that you end up having very wet soil and that tends to kill your seedlings if it's overly wet so you want to start with the right amount of soil at the beginning so if i go in with these queen line zinnia seeds it's, these are ones that have a point, so you could actually just jam them straight down, point side down into the soil. Or if you're unsure, I've talked about this before, anytime you're unsure which way to plant a seed, just lay it down flat on top of the soil and then push it down with your finger. You wanna make sure that it's at least, like basically three times the depth of how thick the seed is, is what most people say, but just try to get a little deeper. Um, you just need it to be beneath soil so they could germinate properly. So that's how easy it is to start something like a zinnia. But if I have something else, for instance, I have um, kabocha squash. So kabocha squash has a big seed and when it emerges, it actually has quite a big seedling. So let me see, I have all my examples in this little mini greenhouse here. So there's a patty pan squash. You could see compared to the one I just showed you, the leaves on this are huge and there's already roots coming at the bottom. That's because it has such a big seed, it's gonna produce a big seedling at the start so I could use a bigger volume of soil to begin with. And that's what I'm gonna do right here. I'm gonna take my kabocha squash, and I'm going to, again, there is, I should mention this since it's a seed starting video. If you look at the seed, there's actually a point to it. So right here is the pointy side of the seed. That's the side of the seed that the root is going to emerge from. So if you plant it, you wanna make sure that the pointy side is down, that way the taproot goes down. If you plant it upside down, What's going to happen is that the taproot's going to emerge, go up, realize that it's not, that's where the, <laughs> the sun is, and then turn around. And the whole plant will have to force itself to do a 180. So if you're worried that you're going to do it wrong, again, just lay the seeds down flat like this and just push them down into your soil. If you're for sure that you know which way you're planting it, then you could go ahead and put it pointy side down. 
push it down into the soil surface. So I'm gonna push these ones back here, pointy side down, and the other ones up front, I'm just going to push down flat. Once you do that, you wanna come back in and just make sure you cover up your seeds. Same thing here, you wanna just cover it up with a little bit more soil, make sure that they're entirely covered. Now I did talk a little bit about vermiculite in that I added it into my soil mix already, but another great use for vermiculite is that it acts like a sponge, but it also lets light through. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to top these six cells right here, some vermiculite. I'm going to push it down a little bit, and then we're gonna actually seed some poppies into that. So poppies are an example of a seed that require light for germination. And when you're dealing with small seeds, the easiest way to deal with it is to make a little crease in your seedling pack like this, and then you wanna angle it so that it's still uphill rather than downhill. And then if you tap either on your wrist or right on your fingers, it's actually really hard to see because the seeds are so small, but I'm seeing little, seedling, little seeds fly out. This is a really nice way to make sure that I get like, for instance, just like six seeds instead of like 20. So just a little tap on your hand will make the seeds want to go uphill and that'll make sure they get in there. So I put it on top of the vermiculite, which will act as a sponge. And now I'm going to also cover it with vermiculite because the vermiculite will let light through. And without light, these poppy seeds will never germinate. Now I actually have a couple different poppies. Here we go. This is a mother of pearl poppy. You can see it's an example already. It has the vermiculite on top that kept the moisture really nice and consistent, but it also let the light through and you have really nice germination. You could see each cell, pretty much every single seed germinated. So that's the idea behind the vermiculite. Now, we have a couple examples of starting seeds, a bigger, like medium sized seed, a tiny seed, and a squash seed. That's probably enough to cover the most of the seeds that you're going to start. Anything else that gets a little more specific, you might need to soak some seeds to speed things up or clip it like a loofah. If you take a little chunk off the end, it'll help speed up germination, but there's way too many details to get into. I highly recommend you actually just read the seedling packets all the way through. They tend to have a lot of information. If they don't, give it a quick Google search and you'll probably find it that way. So one thing that I should do, it's a mortal sin that I actually haven't done this while I was doing it, is that I need to write my labels. Without labels, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know when we started it. We don't know what it is. You might be able to ID it roughly, but you don't know the variety. So I have been a really big fan of these Artline garden markers because they tend to last really long time, even in the sun, whereas Sharpie will fade over time. This is just the basic plastic tag. I'm looking for a better solution, but for now we'll do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna write the variety. So cha-cha kabocha, and then I'm gonna write S with a, a colon, and then I'm gonna write the date. So whatever today's date is, I'm going to go ahead and write that down. And the idea behind this is that by having the date on the tag, I could actually know when I started it. And then when this germinates and I transplant it into the garden, I'll actually come back and I'll write TR colon and the date that I transplanted it. That gives me a mental note, not even a mental note, a real note <laughs> of when I started it, how long it took to transplant and when I put it in the ground. And that gives me a really good sense of how my seedlings are doing. Occasionally, I'll also go ahead and write the seed company so this is Johnny's. I usually don't bother writing Johnny's because I know it's gonna work, but with other seed companies, I like to write the name on there so that if I say, like, I come back, I'm like, wow, none of these seedlings germinated or they all came up weird. I wanna know which seed packet it came from. So that's the idea behind the labeling scheme there. Now that we have a couple seed trays started, I wanna talk a little bit about watering. So what you see here is a tray that has a bunch of slits cut into it. That's on purpose. It's so that when you're watering your plants, they don't, get, they don't sit in water for too long, or if it's sitting outside, like a lot of my seedlings do, and it rains, unfortunately I don't have that problem, but if it rains, the water will be able to drain through. So that's why a lot of seedling trays have these holes. You could also take this, put it in one that doesn't have holes to bottom water. But now let's talk about what bottom watering is, because I haven't actually mentioned it. So we're gonna use this tray that doesn't have holes as an example. The idea behind it is that if you get your seedlings, so I'm gonna go ahead and grab these, some of these are empty, but it doesn't matter, just for demo. What you could do is put them in a tray that has no holes or really just a container, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna grab my watering can. And what I'm gonna do is fill the bottom of the tray with water. And when you do this, you wanna make sure that you have a level surface. So this seedling table right now 
is a level surface. You could see the water in the tray has a nice even level. If it didn't, that would cause different problems. And I'll demonstrate what that would be. If the table, for instance, had a lane like this, your front seedlings are gonna get a lot of water, but the back ones are gonna end up staying dry. So just make sure that wherever you're doing this, you have a nice level surface. So what's happening now, and that's why we talked about having that soil on the bottom here, is that as the soil contacts that water, it'll start sucking it up and bringing it up to the top of the seed trays. That's how all of these were watered, and that's why they all look so moist on top. The other reason why you want to water from below and not from above is that if the top of your soil surface stays wet for too long, it could grow mold, mildew, and you could get things like damping off, which is where a actual mold or mildew will come in and crunch the base of your seed and kill it. So you don't want to make sure, you want to make sure that it has enough time to dry out on the surface, and that's when you're going to want to water. So that brings us to the next point of, how do I know when to water? Well, if you look at the top of a, a cell tray, this one you can see is a little bit dry. And for comparison, this one is a little bit more moist. You can see that the color of the surface here is much lighter than this one. This one's nice and dark. So the other thing you could do is come in with your finger and just kind of scratch the surface. If it's totally dry underneath the surface, then you know it's time to water. And that's really how you're gonna gauge your watering. I wish I could tell you that it's every day, every other day, but it depends on where you have them, how windy it is, how sunny it is, how hot it is. So you really wanna play it by feel, play it by eye, and the bottom watering gives you a really nice way to do that without getting too micromanagey. You could just fill your trays with water, and as they suck it up, you're done. Now, the other thing I'll mention though, is that once you've had your soil sit in here, or your seedlings sit in here for a while, you wanna come back, like let's say after 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you wanna come back and make sure that there's not still standing water in the bottom. Because if there is, then what's gonna happen is the soil is gonna stay too wet for too long and it'll actually suffocate your plants. So after you've given them enough time, like I said, maybe like 20 minutes, you wanna come back, dump your water out and move your seedlings back in. The other thing you could try to do, which is what I usually do, is just tilt it and pour out most of it. One final tip for watering. I know I just told you that you shouldn't do any surface watering, <laughs> but in this case, when you have things like a poppy seed that's very tiny and you have things like vermiculite on top, it's actually nice to water with a hose specifically that has a mist setting. So I'm gonna use these as a demonstration of what happens if you don't use mist. So let's go to shower. I'm gonna just come in from above and water them. So you could, <laughs> that was a little bit extreme like an infomercial, but you can see that what's happening is all the soil is moving out and if the pressure's too high, I actually just blasted a lot of that soil out. If I had my seeds there, I could have just ruined my entire batch of seedlings. Now, if you go to mist, you could come in from above and just go a nice gentle back and forth. This puts out a surprising amount of water. Like it fills my hand almost instantly, but it's much more gentle. And with things like vermiculite, it helps really make sure that the vermiculite is saturated with water and that these poppies are gonna get what they need. So if I do this, I only do it at the beginning when I'll, while I'm waiting for them to germinate. Once they germinate, I entirely switch back to bottom watering. So that's kind of the tips for watering that I have for you today. If you don't have a, if you can't find a tray like this or something like that, or if you're growing them inside on like a seedling heat mat and a heat lamp, then we actually also do have these guys, which are designed to perfectly hold a seedling tray. And then this label is especially long, so let me take that out. But then the tray on top allows you for germination. A couple of little caveats about using these domes. If you're growing outside in full sunlight, you don't actually want to use this because what will happen is that this will create a very, very warm, humid area and it'll roast your seedlings. So this is more for maybe at night to keep it a little insulated or if you're growing indoors and you want to make sure that it stays nice and moist while it's germinating. So these are great and they also let you move them around individually. Now that we've talked about actually getting our soil ready, filling our trays, putting seeds in, I wanted to leave you with a couple extra little tips about where you should actually situate your seedling bench if you are outside. In San Diego, I could do it year round because it's pretty mild. Now things like tomatoes and peppers, I have to wait until the nighttime temps are above 50, but that's pretty easy here in San Diego, that's around March. If you're starting them outside, a couple things to consider. You don't want to put them somewhere where there's too much wind. If this is in a total wind tunnel area, then what's going to happen is as the wind blows over my poppy seeds, it's going to entirely dry out that surface. As soon as the surface dries out, doesn't matter how wet the soil is underneath, 
those poppy seeds are not going to germinate. So you want to protect it a little bit from wind. That's why some of these like little cheap greenhouse towers can be really nice for that because they block the wind and keep the humidity high. The other thing to consider is that you don't want to keep your seedling table out in a totally empty field where it gets full sun all day. Especially as you get into summer, that late, late afternoon sun is quite intense. So in this case, I have the shed right here. And after around 4 or 5 p.m., it'll cast a shadow on the seedling bench and it'll help cool down these seeds for the night. So that's kind of my tip for going outside. The next thing I want to mention actually is that if you're interested in seeing how to care for your seedlings and know when to pot them up and transplant them out into the garden, stay tuned because the second video in this series is going to be talking all about seedling care, potting up, and transplanting in the garden. And with that, thank you guys for watching. I hope you learned something and I'll see you next time.